Most people out there think a microphone is just a microphone, when in reality they are unique and special to each other. Like, take this lavalier. It doesn't sound anything at all like a plant microphone. And of course, this sounds nothing kind of like a boom microphone. And we know this does not sound like a USB podcast microphone. Here on today's episode, we're going to be looking at all of these. I'm Edge from DD Microphones, and this is, is Sound 101. 101. Today we're going to be going over different types of microphones, how they work, what makes them different from each other, and why certain ones are very special. And to do all that, I've got Ethan Lee in the studio who's going to break it all down for us. He's a location sound mixer here in Los Angeles. Ethan, tell the audience a little bit about what you've worked on. Hi guys, I'm Sound Guy Ethan. I've been professionally mixing sound since I was about 14 years old. And I've worked everything from like news to dance competitions to HBO shows. Okay, so it's safe to say you know a lot about microphones. <laughs> Do you think it's important to know all the different kinds of terms for microphones and builds and all that kind of stuff? Well, sound is communication. So you wouldn't just have your boom operator utility show up to set and you tell them, oh, go grab the mic, you know the one, the thing, right? Yeah, the thing. You just expect them to come back with what, like a stick or something like that? You gotta be able to communicate to your people exactly what you need from them so you can also provide the best possible sound. Exactly, communication is key, especially when you're working with other people in your department, and these terms are gonna come into play. So Ethan, there's a ton of different kinds of microphones. What's the first way we can classify a microphone? Well, what separates all of the microphones on the table is the way they physically capture sound. And the three most common types of microphones you'll see are what we got. We got the dynamic microphone, condenser microphone, condenser. and ribbon microphone. And ribbon microphone, okay. So we're gonna start off with the dynamic. So what makes it special versus these two? Well, what separates this from all the rest is the diaphragm inside of it. The diaphragm is a little piece of coiled wire and a magnet inside of it that vibrates or oscillates back and forth in response to sound pressure waves. That vibration is captured by a thin little piece of metal that forms an electrical signal that runs off and gets recorded. So we're talking physical sound waves are moving something here. So that means probably big sound waves are required to actually capture sound. Little sound waves, not so much. And that's why the dynamic microphone is so special. It does great in environments where there's lots of sound pressure, which makes it great for like vocal recording or drums or instruments. It can take a lot of noise and deliver still high fidelity audio. So I'm guessing if it's a sound that's say 20, 30 feet away, not very good at picking it up. Yeah, this one's probably not gonna do so well in a condition where you're trying to get something super directional. But if we're trying to do that, that's where we move on to the condenser mic. Okay. The most common one you'll see on a film set is the condenser mic. The difference between a condenser and a dynamic microphone is that the diaphragm here are two thin sheets of metal very close to each other. One vibrates, one captures, but instead of it being you know, a magnet that's moving back and forth. What you're capturing is the capacitance between two sheets of metal that turn into the sound. So this one's much more sensitive because it's not having to move a coil of wire. And there's no magnets involved. It's, it's just a, a distance change between the two pieces of metal. So much better for more sensitive objects. Oh, absolutely. And it records a bit of a higher fidelity quality sound from a much further distance. But you're right, it does make it more susceptible to distortion when there's lots of sound going around it. Now, what exactly are we looking at here with the ribbon? The diaphragm that separates the ribbon cable from the rest is a little bit more tricky. Originally used in the 1920s, we don't see this one that often on set anymore or okay. in use in general because the diaphragm inside of it is usually just a thin piece of aluminum in between a magnet that similarly vibrates back and forth, gets turned into the sound waves that are sent out. So instead of a coil moving, it's literally just a vibrating piece of aluminum foil. Yep, and the, the thin metal vibrations make it much more sensitive than, let's say, the condenser or the dynamic even over here. So we just learned a bunch of different types of microphones. I wanna throw you a couple of hypotheticals. Number one, I wanna record an airplane that's super loud. I want my microphones as close as possible to get an isolation of just that jet engine. Well, to do... 
To do that, I'd probably get uh, something like a dynamic microphone, something that could take a lot of SPL. You know, there's gonna be a lot of ambient noise, a lot of crazy sound waves coming off from a jet engine taking off. You're probably gonna be outside right next to the runway. So there's gonna be lots of noise that you're trying to capture, but you want something that won't distort. So a dynamic microphone will probably get you something that's usable. Okay, so let's go on the other side of the whole situation. I, let's say, am a coffee shop musician. I want to capture that vibe that I'm going for with my coffee shop music. So I want to capture some of the shop and my instrument at the same time. What should I go with? A condenser would probably be the best fit for that because you want something that is inconspicuous, a little bit lightweight, and something that has a very wide dynamic range. You want to pick up, you know, the vibe, as you say, of all the restaurant goers. You probably want to you know, get some ambience, the clinking of the kitchen, et cetera, et cetera, and also the mediocre guitar playing that you probably are doing. Absolutely. Okay, Ethan, what is the next way we can classify these microphones? Well, we just talked a lot about diaphragms that are in the microphones, but we didn't really talk about the difference in size of the diaphragms inside of the microphones. Okay. So to illustrate that, we got the large diaphragm over here, small diaphragm over here, and this one. lastly, the micro one. But first, I want to hear more about the large diaphragm. What you get with the larger microphone and the larger diaphragm is higher fidelity, okay. but a lot more weight, which is why you don't see them so much on set. You know, it's not easy to swing them around. The larger diaphragm means a larger surface area of the diaphragm, which translates to a wider frequency range and a little bit more sensitivity. So they're sensitive, but we don't necessarily want that for video production. Well, with a large diaphragm microphone, you want it to stay put. So you see it a lot on podcasting tables and most primary use cases, vocals and instruments inside of a studio setting. Okay, so treated rooms, things that we control everything with. Now, where would I find something like this? So what we got here is a small diaphragm microphone. The smaller the diaphragm, the smaller the microphone, which makes it much lighter. What you do lose is a little bit of that fidelity, which turns into audio quality, but what you get is a stiff diaphragm that is a little bit more resistant to sound pressure levels and a much wider or longer pickup range. Okay, so we're talking about something that we're not necessarily getting to the lowest of the lows like a, like a big diaphragm can capture. We're also maybe not capturing the highest of the highs, but for dialogue, this seems to be doing everything we need, right? Yeah, exactly, and that's why it's the most common and most useful on set. Perfect, so if this is a small one and that's a large one, what are we going with this guy? Well, I believe you call this one a micro diaphragm, which people don't really know what goes on inside of a lavalier microphone, which is what we see here. Now, like we said earlier, the smaller the diaphragm, the less fidelity you get. That's true. But what you get there is a lot more versatility, and the closer you can get the microphone to the person, the higher quality the audio will be overall. So really, when you think about it, when you trade off the size of the diaphragm, you're really getting the same quality, or if not better quality, than the small condenser once you get it that close to a person. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to if you're in a wide shot, I don't care what diaphragm, you get the biggest diaphragm, super sensitive, high fidelity. But if I have to put that thing like five feet away from you because I'm in a wide versus putting a little tiny lavalier like bam, it's just oh, always, yeah, this is always going to sound amazing versus that, right? We've got two more hypotheticals coming into you right now. I want to start a podcast about gardening. What size diaphragm should I use? Well, Andrew, you're probably gonna want something with a larger diaphragm, you know, like a vocal mic or something that'll pick up the vocal range you got. You know, you want something that'll deliver high quality audio. Podcasting is an audio driven medium. You want something that will provide the best quality product possible. I totally agree with you on that one. So large diaphragm. Now let's go in the other opposite direction, not gardening podcast. I wanna do an action movie. I want to do something with ninjas, I want to do something with explosions, and a lot of running. What am I going to do to record that? You're probably going to want something with a smaller diaphragm, something that's like, you know, a condenser mic or shotgun microphone, something that you can use really lightly, you know, something that you can whip around with on set, something that will get a lot of range, something that will give you, you know, the best quality product from the furthest distance that's, you know, also the lightest. So this time around, we have a lot more microphones than before. How are we going to break down and classify these mics? Well, so now we're gonna talk about polar patterns. If you've done a little bit of digging or research or tried to buy your own mic even, you'll see a lot of people talking about polar or pickup patterns. 
Now essentially what it is, it's that little circular shape you'll see on the mic or describing the mic. It describes basically two things, decibels and distance. Imagine that the polar pattern is a circle, right? You got a cross section, and in the middle of the cross section is where the front of the mic is. And essentially the radius and area around it tells you how loud and from what distance you're gonna pick up a certain sound and from what angle. Okay, so let's take a look at this one right here. What do we got in front of us? To start off, we got the cardioid pickup pattern. Okay. For those of you guys who are paying attention, cardioid sounds a lot like cardio, which is I believe the Latin root word for heart. That's correct. Because the shape vaguely resembles that of a heart. Um, you don't really get the nice little pointy edges at the end of it because it's a circle, but you do get this sort of nice circular curved angle around it, which means you get a lot in front of the microphone, but not so much behind it. So to start off, we got the cardioid microphone, right? So if I pick it up, as you can hear, you know, this area, this distance, probably really, really good. This is a sweet spot for sound, right? Over here, probably not too off axis. Over here, you're probably hearing me exactly the same as I was right here. But as soon as I turn it around, right? Now we're living in that sort of area of the polar pattern where there's just an absolute dead space. We're probably not getting too much back here because this is the angle of rejection. So it's a very directional microphone. Okay, now what kind of use cases would I use that for? Well, because the direction of it's sort of wider than most, I think it makes really good um, interview close-up sort of microphones. You capture a lot of natural ambience around, you get really good close-up coverage of your subject. Um, it's good for just picking up generally a lot going on in a closed environment. So you're talking about two people talking and you wanna capture both of us, it's a little bit wider, and I could just put that right here between us and it would pick us both up with less dramatic cueing mm -hmm. between on the boom. What about this one in front of us? What is this? So over here we got the super cardioid, very similar in fashion to the regular cardioid microphone, except the difference here is that we got the curve and a little bit behind it. So now you're listening to the super cardioid mic, right? Very similar pickup pattern to the cardioid. You're probably hearing me fairly decently. You know, very similar range from the side, probably sound very similar. You're probably gonna hear a little bit of that handling noise. Um, but once I start spinning around, you're probably not gonna get me as well from the direct side of the microphone. But if I spin it all the way back, you're not gonna get me as clear probably from the front of the microphone, but just because there's that little bubble in the back where the pickup pattern is a little bit wider, you're probably gonna hear me just a little bit. Probably won't sound that good though. A little bit more directional? It functioned in a very similar way towards the cardioid mic, but you just shave off a little bit on the side. A little bit on the side. But you do have to worry about, you know, the area behind the microphone, just around this area. So you want to point that sort of dead spots or, you know, areas where you're not really getting too much sound. Okay. So it's kind of like a balloon. You go and you squeeze it and you don't want those areas, but eventually it's got to go somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you, you're picking up sensitivity. It's just, where do we want to direct that sensitivity? And I'm guessing that based on the shape of this one, we've squeezed the heck out of that balloon. Oh, absolutely. Here we got the shotgun or low bar pickup pattern. Now this one's really special. This one probably has the most variety out of all of them because obviously condenser sort of shotgun microphones are the most used in the television industry, which means there's a lot more of them out there. So essentially the way you're gonna see this one is it looks almost like an upside down lowercase t where you get a really, really directional sort of narrow path a little bit out to the sides and then a little bit at the bottom. And essentially what's happening there is all the sound that's in front of the microphone because of this long section called the interference tube, you're picking up a lot of the directionality of the microphone of a subject that's really far away, but you're rejecting a lot of the off axis noise through a process inside of the interference tube called phase cancellation. We can get to that some other day. So this might sound a little bit bad from up here because I'm a little too close for what it's meant for. If you remember, shotguns and low bar pattern mics are supposed to be used from a distance on film sets to get a subject that's a bit farther away. So Andrew, to help illustrate this point, could you go back there so I can ask you a question real quick? Okay. So I'll back up. Alrighty, Andrew, what's your favorite Pokemon? My favorite Pokemon is Alakazam because he's got spoons and likes ice cream. So as you could tell from that example, you probably heard Andrew very well from that distance, but probably not me asking the question so well because I was off axis on the side over here. Now to illustrate the inverse of this, I'm gonna point the mic at you guys and I'm gonna have Andrew go back there again for another question. Okay. All right, what's your, uh, what's your favorite X-Men? My favorite X-Men is Wolverine because he has knives. Because he has knives. So as you can see from that example, you probably heard Andrew not at all. I mean, he was completely off axis. He was in the area where 
you probably weren't picking up anything and if anything you probably heard me a little bit worse because I was super off axis right in that weird dead spot in the bottom little corner of the microphone's pickup pattern. So this one is much better for if I'm trying to just isolate a sound. Absolutely, and that's why it's most common on film sets. And it's even much more common if you see in like news settings or on sets where the location's a little bit wilder because it does a really great job of rejecting everything that's not your subject. All that stuff going on around us, the traffic over there, the people talking over there, and I wanna hear you in my film. I want my audience to concentrate on you, the actor, so that's the one I'm gonna go with. Exactly. Let's talk about this one now. What do we do with this? Arguably just as popular as the shotgun microphone. This, on the lavaliers, you're probably gonna find a omnidirectional pattern, which means, you know, if you're very perceptive, omni, all. You're picking up basically the entire radius around the mic. So if we're looking at that circular diagram, you're gonna see basically the entire radius around it is probably gonna be taken up. Pretty um, evenly covered from the behind oh, yeah. to the front. And now you guys are listening to the omnidirectional mic. This is a Deity VLOF, and as you can tell, if Andrew, you wanna have a little conversation with me, yeah. we sound pretty good from both angles of it, right? It captures a very circular, all-encompassing pickup pattern. I'm roughly on the left side, you're roughly on the right side. If a omnidirectional microphone has a side, even if I'm slightly behind this microphone, you're probably hearing me the exact same way if it was in front of me. We talk a lot about, you know, placing microphones and lavaliers um, in like people's hair and stuff like that. And the reason why that stuff works so well is because lavaliers are omnidirectional and no matter how you place it, it's generally gonna sound the same. What about this? This is that ribbon microphone we talked about. It's a funnier microphone than the rest. These are all condensers. What's a ribbon? What's the deal? So the funny thing about these sort of ribbon microphones is that, as you can see on the grill side over here, it's open, but this section right here is sort of closed off. That indicates sort of a figure eight or bi-directional pickup pattern, which means that both the front and the back, if you look at the diagram, the north and the southward facing um, poles are gonna look very similar to each other in sort of an eight fashion. Okay, so this would be one of those situations where if I wanna put it between us, we could have a conversation and we would come in pretty clear, but the people to the left and right of us would not, right? We wouldn't hear them at all. So are there only five pickup patterns? No, and generally speaking, all microphones have a different pickup pattern. They fall into different little categories, but overall each microphone's unique, each microphone of the same brand is unique. You know, there's lots of different mics to choose from, and it's just a matter about dialing in which one you want to use and for what use case. Two more hypotheticals, Ethan. First one, you have a yoga instructor, okay? They need to be mic'd up so their class can hear the instructions. What kind of pickup pattern would you use? Well, you're, you're gonna want something like an omnidirectional headset microphone, you know, something that'll go around the ear, come around the front, and because it's such a weird angle, you know, you're gonna want that omnidirectional pickup pattern. And because those come with something, you know, smaller like a lavalier, it won't obtrude the face of the yoga instructor and you, you'll probably get a really good, you know, sound quality right up next to them. Very uniform as they move around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hypothetical number two, I want to interview a firefighter in front of a fire helicopter that's currently operational. What am I going to use? Well, you're probably going to want something that'll handle a lot of off-axis rejection. You know, there's going to be lots of noise around. There's going to be, you know, the helicopter blades. If they're coming off from a, you know, fighting a forest fire, there's probably going to be a lot of outside noise. You want something super directional, so like a super cardioid, you know, condenser microphone, something like a, you know, standard shotgun microphone, something that'll pick up a, from a distance, that'll handle, you know, the SPL pretty well, and will capture your subject really accurately. Okay. It is safe to say that we have covered this subject super in depth, three different ways to look at it. We have gone over everything and I just wanna say thank you, Ethan, for being here to make this a much more easy, palatable way to get through it all. Of course, you're welcome. And guys, you're now ever so much closer to being a professional sound mixer. Yeah, vocabulary and communication is key on a film set. Using the right terms is gonna make you go so much further in your career than if you kept calling it, go get that thing, Maybe not that thing, I meant that other thing. Hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss a single video and you gotta hit that bell for notifications so you are one of the first people when we drop videos here on the channel. Hit that like, it really helps us with the algorithm here on YouTube. I'm Andrew from DD Microphones. Thank you for watching.